Now, who fired the shot that killed Viscount Dundee? Was it Donald McBain, one of the government soldiers who is said to have leapt the 18 feet gap here while fleeing the Jacobite victors? So invincible had Claverhouse seemed to be that it was said that he had made a pact with the devil and couldn't be killed by ordinary means, only by a silver bullet. And various rumours arose as to who had fired the magic shot that struck down the infamous persecutor. But before trying to solve that, we need to step back a few years and introduce another William, who, like the Laird of Claverhouse, was a frequent visitor to the place of Paisley, someone who was a loyal friend to both Viscount Dundee and to Jean and the Cochrane family. William Livingston, second son of Viscount Kilsyth, was of a noble family of long standing. His father's castle here in Kilsyth had been razed to the ground by Oliver Cromwell in 1650 as a punishment for his royalist sympathies. This is all that's left of it. However, the family also had the nearby castle of Colium or Colseum as it tends to be pronounced nowadays. And we'll have occasion to go there shortly. Livingston, Lord Kilsyth was a Lieutenant Colonel in the Royal Scots Dragoons and also a Member of Parliament for Stirlingshire. With the change of allegiance of the army from King James to William of Orange, Lord Kilsyth and his regiment found themselves expected to fight for a prince they considered a usurper and against the King whom they believed to be the God-ordained monarch. Matters were made worse when the regiment was assigned to the army which was to pursue the rebel force led by Viscount Dundee, Kilsyth's old friend John Graham. This put Kilsyth even more into a crisis of conscience and he resolved that if he got within striking distance of Dundee's army, he and his regiment would change sides rather than fight against him. He could do nothing openly, but he succeeded in getting a written message to Lady Dundee to that effect and she managed to pass the word on to Viscount Dundee. Despite his attempts at secrecy, Lord Kilsyth fell under the suspicion of the army's commander, Major General Hugh Mackay, who had him watched. When Kilsyth's troops were stationed at Dundee, Claverhouse, knowing of their desire to join him, came near to the city, but due to uncertainty regarding the standing of one of his officers, Kilsyth was unable openly to give the command to defect. The regiment stayed put and Viscount Dundee was obliged to depart without these reinforcements. Major General Mackay got wind of this too and a few days later when a couple of messengers from Lord Kilsyth to Viscount Dundee were captured and confessed, he ordered the arrest of Kilsyth and his fellow officers. Lord Kilsyth's attempt to assist his friend Claverhouse was thwarted. He was court-martialed and sent to prison in Edinburgh where he spent the next five years. The conditions in the Edinburgh Tolbooth prison were atrocious, particularly for political prisoners. Not only were the physical privations severe, but the prisoners were also cut off from outside news, particularly about how the rebellion was going. Nevertheless, Lord Kilsyth eventually learned that an engagement had finally taken place between the two armies and that the side with which he sympathised had been victorious. But the further news that Viscount Dundee, his friend John Graham of Claverhouse, had lost his life in the battle, leading ultimately to the collapse of the cause, would only serve to compound his sufferings. His health deteriorated rapidly. Eventually he was moved from high security jail to house arrest. His physical condition was so bad he wouldn't have been able to run off if he'd tried. Viscountess Dundee, having lost both her husband and her son, became aware of the desperate plight of her childhood family friend and husband's loyal ally. Despite being under suspicion herself, 
With her powerful connections, she was able to obtain permission to visit Lord Kilsyth, and she gradually nursed him back to health. Since they were both well-known figures in Scottish society, it wasn't long before this association filled the salons and parlours with gossip. And it wasn't long before William, Lord Kilsyth, now in his early 40s but still a bachelor, asked the 30-year-old widow Jean, Lady Dundee, to marry him. There was an inauspicious element to the courtship which adds a touch of romance to our story. At some point, William Lord Kilsyth was granted permission to return home here to Kilsyth to organise his affairs. As the younger brother of the second Viscount of Kilsyth, home was the modest Colzeum Castle, which as we saw earlier had survived Oliver Cromwell's destructive swathe through Scotland, whereas the Kilsyth's principal seat, Kilsyth Castle, had not. William, when he later inherited the title Viscount from his brother, had the old castle demolished and built in its place this more modern house. When he visited home, it's said that he took Jean with him and that while there the couple exchanged rings. Jean, so the story goes, walking alone one day in the grounds of Colliam House, inadvertently dropped and lost her ring. Surely a bad omen. But then shortly after that, Lord Kilsyth too dropped and lost the one he had received from Jean. An apocryphal tale? Maybe, but let's just bookmark it for the time being. On returning to Edinburgh, Lord Kilsyth and Viscountess Dundee were married on the 19th of September 1693, and that was when tongues really began to wag. Why, wasn't it now self-evident who it was that had fired the silver bullet that had taken down the invincible Viscount Dundee at Killycrankie? Wasn't it now plain for all to see that Lord Kilsyth had harboured a secret longing for his friend's beautiful wife? and on the battlefield had seized the chance to rid himself of his rival for her affections. Moreover, the Viscountess herself must have been complicit in this arrangement. Otherwise, how would she now accept an offer of marriage from her husband's murderer? There was a fatal flaw which easily disposed of that neat conspiracy theory. You remember that William Livingston, far from fighting against Viscount Dundee, had been arrested for his part in the real conspiracy of planning to defect to Dundee's side with his whole regiment, and on the day the Viscount was killed on the battlefield, was already languishing in an Edinburgh prison far away from the field of Killycrankie. The prevailing political climate, much more than the wagging tongues, made it impossible for the newlyweds to remain in their native Scotland. Having conspired with one who was considered a traitor to king and country, Lord Kilsyth could only expect the death penalty. But he had powerful friends who interceded for him, and he himself had written to the new King William from his prison cell, referring to himself as the sincerest of penitents and appealing for mercy. The king spared his life, but left him in prison and ordered the confiscation of the rent from his estates. Eventually, on the 10th of May, 1694, the Scottish Council received a letter from the King authorising the liberation of Lord Kilsyth, but on the condition that he left the country immediately and that he couldn't return without the King's express permission. Lord Kilsyth and Lady Dundee went to Holland, where they were sure they could 
build a new life for themselves amongst sympathetic acquaintances and find some respite from the suspicion that hung around them from their association with Claverhouse. Although they were now amongst like-minded friends, they had difficulty finding a suitable home and they spent the first months of their exile in a series of lodgings, ultimately in Utrecht. But despite the unsettled circumstances, they were at least able to move around freely. And that blessing was greatly increased when a few months after their arrival, Jean gave birth to a son. The tragedy of her first marriage with the loss of both husband and child seemed to have been reversed. But the happiness was not to last long. Whilst waiting for more permanent accommodation, they were lodged in Utrecht at an inn called the Castle of Antwerp. It was a type of building still visible in many parts of Holland to this day, with warehouse space on the top floor and a hoist to lift goods. The loft space in this inn was being used by the owners to store large quantities of peat for heating fuel. On the 16th of October 1695, several Scots, including a certain Mr Stewart, dined at midday with Lord Kilsyth and Lady Dundee at the inn. Mr Stewart tells us in a letter he wrote next day that Lady Dundee was extraordinary good company during the meal. About quarter past two, Mr Stewart continues, he left the company to return to his own lodgings. But before he even arrived there, someone came running to tell him that the ceiling of the Kilsyth room had collapsed and it was thought they were all dead. Mr Stewart rushed back to the inn and found rescuers trying to extricate a badly injured but still alive Lord Kilsyth from the debris near the door. But by the time they managed to dig further in, to where Jean, her baby and the nurse had been, it was too late. All three had perished. From another letter written the same day by diplomat Sir Andrew Kennedy, who had hurried to Utrecht on the news of the tragedy, we learned that the room above was filled with some 300 tonne of turf, which was so overloaded that the roof, loft, floor and all fell, which crushed that poor lady, her sweet son and gentlewoman, to death. Sir Andrew continues, Kilsyth, no wonder, is overwhelmed with inexpressible grief and sorrow at so sore and sudden a stroke. What was Lord Kilsyth to do now? <laughs> 